So recently, I made a video about the Konoha 13, specifically ranking and explaining the Konoha 13 as adults based on usefulness. That is to say, we weren't talking about how strong they were, but instead by how useful they are to Konoha or the greater ninja world currently. And you can't make a video like that without calling a couple of people useless. And if we're being entirely real, at least half of the Konoha 13 as it currently stands are some degree of useless, which has actually always been one of the bigger flaws of Naruto. In what feels like such a wide, expansive, and well thought out world, only the true main characters ever proved to be any use whatsoever. With characters like Shino and Ino and Kiba and Ten Ten falling through the cracks. And while Naruto isn't the only offender of all time to lose track of its own side characters, in recent years, we've seen incredible rosters of characters all prove their usefulness in different ways. The best example I can currently think of is Black Clover where weaker black bulls who don't get a lot of screen time like Magna have bossed up and had incredible moments, with Magma going so far as to defeat one of the Dark Triads. So naturally, as I spent a half hour talking about how the majority of the members of the Konoha 13 were useless, a lot of people either put in the comments or emailed me the question, how would I make every individual member of the Konoha 13 as useful as they possibly could be? That is to say, what character differences would I make for each individual member of the Konoha 13 to maximize their potential. So I've decided to do exactly that today. Create key character differences in the plots of every single member of the Konoha 13 in order to not only maximize their power in a way that makes sense, but also maximize their potential output of usefulness to the ninja world as a whole. Now, before we get into this, I'm not going to say that every single one of them just happens to stumble upon a Rinnegan and pop it in their eye and become a god that can battle against the Otsutsuki. We're going to look at realistic changes that every single character of the Konoha 13 could have made in order to make sure that they not only would have got more screen time, but also would have been able to help the likes of Naruto and Sasuke in a way that was even remotely useful. Because it currently stands, the only useful people in the entirety of Konoha are Ino, Shikamaru, Naruto, and Sasuke, with everyone else falling into a bucket of mediocrity or downright uselessness. But before we get to diving into this list, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, hit that noti bell. And if you like hearing my opinions on anime, then you're going to love my other YouTube channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk about any other anime. And if you like the concept of me talking about multiple anime, then you're going to love my brand new anime podcast called Utaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata talk about everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So the Konoha 13, some of them are god-busting, chakramek-wielding monsters, and some of them or housewives. Well, obviously in a group of 13 ninjas, there's gonna be a disparity in strength and usefulness. Amongst the Konoha 13, that disparity is significantly too large. Characters who once held an immense amount of promise have now been reduced to nothing more than a filler character we get to see once every 200 episodes. But if we're being real, this isn't a new problem to Naruto. The last time the Konoha 13 came together and did something useful was the Sasuke retrieval arc. But obviously each member of the Konoha 13 had their own individual little moment in the fourth great Shinobi World War, like Shino taking on Tarune Aburame, or Ten Ten taking out Kakuzo's lightning mask using one of the treasured tools of the Sage of Six Paths. These few and far between moments for the members of the Konoha 13, not named Sakura, Naruto, or Sasuke, are emblematic of the greater problem surrounding Naruto. What originally started as an ensemble anime turned into a story about two dudes who kind of missed each other. And even My Hero Academia, which has received flack for very similar issues in the manga currently, is making sure that every single member of Class 1A and Class 1B is getting their time in the sun. Even heroes from other hero high schools who were loved during the provisional license exam arc are now getting their time in the sun. But what if Naruto wasn't like this? What if Kishimoto actually took time to flesh out these side characters in anything that wasn't filler episodes? As if you're counting filler episodes, people like Kiba and Shino have probably had equal amounts of screen time as Naruto and Sasuke. But what we're concerned with here is canon. Canon moments that come from the manga where the Konoha 13 have to step up and prove their usefulness on the grandest stage. And unfortunately, it feels as though we simply just don't get that. But what if we did? What would that universe for Naruto look like? How would each of these individual members of the Konoha 13 change? Well, I wrote some notes, so let's get into it. I figured there'd be no better place to start than the unilaterally agreed on most useless person in the Konoha 13, Ten Ten. See, Ten Ten, as it currently stands, owns a weapon store during peacetime. So a dying weapon store. But in this weapon store, Ten Ten has three of the six treasured tools of the Sage of Six Paths. Three of the strongest weapons on Earth. And Ten Ten is able to use all of these weapons because Ten Ten is actually preternaturally incredible at one thing in one thing alone, weapon mastery. Ten Ten, in a matter of seconds after picking up a weapon, learns how to use it 
perfectly. This is why she was able to use the Basho Sen in two swings. And even though she was only able to launch two attacks with the Basho Sen because it drained all of her chakra, being able to master one of the treasure tools of the Sage of Six Paths in a matter of seconds is a very impressive feat. But unfortunately, collecting all of the treasure tools of the Sage of Six Paths and using them isn't an option for Ten Ten. She doesn't have enough chakra. The only reason Ginkaku and Kinkaku could use them is because they were descendants of Hagoromo and also pseudo Ninetales Jinchuriki. But this doesn't mean that there wasn't avenues to strength for Ten Ten. See, Ten Ten's strength was derived from how many weapons she was able to unseal and throw. Therefore, for the majority of Naruto, her value and her power is tied directly to how many weapons she can summon and how accurately she can throw them. However, to anybody with even a small amount of wind release, this is nothing. So what if instead of trying to focus on unsealing weapons from her scrolls fast, their 1010 shifted her focus elsewhere. What if instead 1010 committed herself to hunting down the legendary weapons of the world? Weapons like the treasured tools or the seven swords of the mist. And while 1010 may not be able to use the treasured tools, she could absolutely use the majority of the seven swords of the mist. The only sword out of the seven swords of the mist that requires a high amount of chakra is Samehara. The only other sword out of the seven swords of the mist that even requires chakra is the Kiba blades. But as far as we know, they don't require that much chakra. So what if 1010 went on a similar path to Mangetsu Hozuki? So I get to his older brother who collected all seven of the seven swords of the mist. However, her scope extended outside of the seven swords. In 1010, upon collecting a myriad of different legendary weapons, was able to summon these legendary weapons for whatever situation arise. Are you coming up against an enemy with diamond hard skin? Summon the Kiba Blades, the sharpest swords in the world. Is there a group of low level enemies in front of you you need to get out of your way? Summon the Basho Sen and hit them with wind release. Giving 1010 an arsenal of weapons that work in different functions would have made her not only incredibly practical, but also very versatile, skyrocketing her to high Jonin or low Kage level easily. Not to mention, we could have gotten an arc of her and her team hunting down these legendary weapons in order to make her stronger, maybe before the fourth great Shinobi World War, which not only would have boosted her usefulness as a character, but also given her more screen time, something she desperately needs. Now, unfortunately, strength does often tie to one's usefulness in a shonen anime. Though, fortunately, the next person on our list doesn't have that rule applied to them. I don't really have an order I'm going in. I just kind of wrote their names down and how I would change them. Because the next person on our list is Eno. See, Eno, as it currently stands, to me at least, amongst all of the Konoha 13 adults, is the fourth most useful person in the entirety of Konoha. Naruto's the Hokage, Sasuke is the Shadow Hokage, Shikamaru's the right hand to the Hokage, but Eno plays an incredibly pivotal role. See, Eno, as it currently stands, Stands is the leader of two separate teams. Eno is the head of the interrogation team in Konoha and the sensory unit. And it was with Eno's sensory abilities that the bubble around Konoha that tracks the chakra signatures of anybody who comes in or leaves was created. Therefore, between the sensory unit and the interrogation unit, Eno is probably the most important person for the overall defense of Konoha as a village. So how would I change her to make her more useful? I wouldn't. I think Eno's shift from being the most useless out of Eno she could show to being a Sakura copy to her current form is actually one of the better examples of character development in Naruto. A character who Kishimoto could have thrown out as easily as Kiba or Shino now plays a pivotal role in protecting Konoha. And in a way that makes sense, as Eno can use her Yamanaka abilities to read somebody's mind, meaning that there has to be no physical interrogation. Any information she wants to know from your brain, she can get. And it was well known that the Yamanaka were always incredible sensors. That's why they were used as human telephones. The only difference I would have made to Eno's backstory at all is that during the blank period, I would have made her a member of the Ombu. As an incredible sensor type ninja and also a person who can extract information from anybody that she wants to simply by placing her hand on them, she is arguably the perfect skill set for being in the Ombu. Not to mention that the mind transfer technique is kind of perfect for reconnaissance, as Eno could just transfer into somebody's mind and walk around as them for 30 minutes and gather information, or transfer into somebody's mind and have them go on a killing spree in their camp. It doubly makes sense when you consider the fact that Eno is hooking up with Sai, who's also a member of the Ambu. I think being in the Ambu for four or five years could have brought a big boost to her ninjutsu and taijutsu abilities. And while she's still incredibly useful in Boruto, those couple of years would have made her a better well-rounded shinobi. But then again, if she'd entered the Ambu, there is a chance she could have died. Kind of like the next entry on our list, Neji. See, Neji is currently the only ninja out of Konoha 13 less useful than Tenten, because he's dead. So how would I make him more useful? Well, one, I would move the sticks out of his body. So let's say hypothetically somehow Obito mists and Neji doesn't end up dying. 
How does Alive Neji prove to be more useful than he was prior to his death? Because if we're being real, his death was the most important thing he ever did. And while I could sit here and say that I want Neji to become the world's strongest Byakugan user, who goes on to become the Kage and lead the Hyuga into their grandest era, I don't think that's Neji's path. Ironically, I believe the greatness out of Neji would have come from a more political angle. See, as it currently stands, the Hyuga clan is still very much split into the main family and the branch family. I believe that Neji's true usefulness would have come from working together with Hinata as respective leaders of the side in main branch families to come together and break down the barrier in the Hyuga clan, with both Hinata and Neji leading the Hyugas into a more cohesive future. As the system of having a side in main branch family not only is barbaric, but not really necessary anymore. Since the Shinobi Alliance currently exists, if any of the other ninja villages moved against the Hyuga family, it would be considered an act of war, and the side branch family only exists to protect the Byakugan. And considering Shikamaru's second light novel, when Konoha decided to divulge all the information they have about ninjutsu, taijutsu, and genjutsu, and shinobi wear to all the other villages. All the other villages can ask about the Byakugan as much as they want. All information is being shared amongst all villages. So Neji's true usefulness is leading the Hyugas into a more cohesive future, becoming a high level Jonin and probably getting a couple of Genin to teach. Oh, and knocking up Tenten. But speaking of people who would have been more useful if they were dead, next up on the list we have Kiba. Kiba is currently a cop who sells dog food. I wish I was kidding, genuinely. Kiba is a Jonin and any mission that requires sniffing out a scent, he gets called up for. However, since there's a whole lot of missions outside the village, Kiba is usually involved in domestic affairs, meaning he's usually working side by side with the Konoha police to find criminals. Outside of that, he's kind of the most famous in Uzuka, and therefore he's the face of a lot of dog food brands. And well, that's fine. He's technically an influencer. I can't really judge him. He could have achieved a lot more. See, since Kiba is still a Jonin and is still involved in Jonin-esque things, a lot of his value is tied intrinsically to his power. And unfortunately, Kiba kind of stays at the same power level for like 750 episodes. See, we all know Kiba's moveset. It's human beast clone and fang over fang. That or him and Akamaru combined together to make a two-headed wolf. And this two-headed wolf increased their speed, power, durability, all that. Nowadays in Boruto, since he has Akamaru and another dog whose name I don't actually know, he can create a three-headed wolf, which is Cerberus, technically. But is this three-headed wolf version stronger than his two-headed wolf version? Sort of. It has the same move set as the two-headed version. So what if instead of just acquiring new dogs to jam into a wolf to give that wolf more heads, Kiba took a different route. See, we're fully aware that you can summon dogs. Two separate people have dog summons in Naruto that aren't from the Inazuka clan. Kakashi is able to summon eight Ninken. And while the individual Ninken that Kakashi is able to summon probably isn't as strong as an individual ninja hound, as ninja hounds are raised specifically to, you know, be ninja hounds, and the Ninken that Kakashi found are more likely not just strays that he befriended as a child, this lets us know that you can enter with dogs into a summoning contract. And it's very effective. But Kakashi isn't even the only circumstance where we see a dog get summoned. Nagato has one. Through the power of the animal path, Nagato has a myriad of different massive animal summons, one of which is a massive dog. Now, it's unclear as to whether or not the animal path creates these summons or the animal path simply allows you to control these animals. We never go into detail on it, because in the fact that all of these animals have the chakra rods that Nagato uses to control the six paths of pain, and running on for eyes, I more lean towards the fact that the animal path actually simply allows you to control massive amounts of huge animals, which would imply that there is a species of Clifford the Red-esque dogs. A group of massive, several hundred foot tall hounds somewhere. So I propose that Kiba, much in the same fashion of 1010, goes on a mission looking for these dogs. And using the information and the experience he's gathered by raising Akamaru and other ninja hounds, learns to train these somewhat feral massive dogs, which he in a very similar capacity to Naruto with the toads, learns how to summon and use in battle, giving Kiba one of the stronger summons in Naruto. And we all know how far a strong summon can propel you forward in terms of power in Naruto. And then Kiba can do fang over fang with this massive dog, or combined with that dog to give it another head. I think this is significantly more compelling than an endless slew of huskies. But speaking of raising an endless slew of pups, next up on the list we have Hinata. She's the only one in the Konoha 13 with two kids, which is weird, right? But then again, how many of the Konoha 13 had siblings? Sasuke, obviously. And like, Shino? I think Shino has a brother? Does Ino? 
Does Eno have a brother? I like that Kishimoto worked in the concept of Japan's declining population into the Naruto world. Anyways, Hinata. Hinata is probably currently, unfortunately, the biggest leader in wasted potential in Naruto. Hinata has the last vestiges of Hamura's chakra, much in the same capacity that Naruto has the last vestiges of Hagoromo's. On top of that, with the creation of Twin Lion Fist, Hinata was one of the youngest people ever to create a jutsu, with the only people beating her out being Minato and Kakashi. Pretty good company. And yet the current role that she serves in Naruto is housewife, which I get. I, I do understand why she's a housewife. She has two children and her husband is the Hokage. Unfortunately, somebody did have to be at home in that situation and it wasn't gonna be the Hokage. But Sakura is in a similar, if not identical situation and still finds time to run the hospital and run the occasional ninja mission like she did in Sasuke Retsudan. Now, obviously Sakura only has one child and that's Sarada who's significantly older than Himawari. But you're telling me Konohamaru won't keep an eye on Himawari? Now, while I would love to sit here and tell you that I want Hinata to be a high level Jonin out there busting skulls with Hamaru's chakra, it's just not the logical path for her. See, Hinata is the current head of the Hyuga clan. She is the Byakugan princess. In my ideal world of usefulness, I've already touched on this. I would love to see her and Neji working together to break down the barriers in the Hyuga clan. Getting an arc in Boruto about Hinata trying to make a political and lifestyle change in the Hyuga clan that's existed for centuries would be incredible. And honestly, a deep dive into the culture and politics of the Naruto world is one of the biggest things that Naruto as a whole is missing, as really the only times we get anything in terms of exposition is through combat. So watching Hinata try to break down the preconceived notions that the side family is less than the main branch family and therefore should sacrifice their bodies to make sure that the main branch family never lose their Byakugan would be really cool. And it would also bring to light the better aspects of Hinata's character, like the fact that she's incredibly intelligent and loving. But enough about talking about possible character development, let's move to our next entry on the list, Choji. The reason I say let's move beyond talking about character development is because Choji's already basically doing everything that he possibly could. Choji's a Jonin who still goes out on missions occasionally and is known as the physically strongest ninja in Konoha. That's kind of everything you would expect from Choji. And on top of all that, he's the current leader of the Akamichi clan. For all intents and purposes, that's that's, that's pretty good. He bagged Karui from the Hidden Cloud. He had a child with Chocho. And well, technically, for a lot of the Konoha 13, you could make the argument, why did they never have a team of Genin? Or why did we never get to see it? And that's because Jonin with children never get teams of Genin. Ironically, having a team of Genin is kind of like a singles party. It's kind of like your first job out of college. If your first job out of college was teaching kindergartners with guns. So I'm not gonna sit here and say that Choji should have got his own team of Genin, because there was only three or four years between the end of the fourth great Shinobi World War and when Karui popped out Chocho. And so far as power goes, Choji is very powerful. Choji and his father Chozo were able to go toe to toe with the ghetto statue for a little bit. And while obviously the ghetto statue isn't the Ten Tails, it's still the husk of the Ten Tails. Being able to go toe to toe with that for even a little bit is very impressive. The only way that I would recommend to make Choji stronger is to master other things that aren't Yang release. So the Akamichi calorie conversion focuses on making fat in to chakra. The chakra is then used to expand the body using yang release. The highest form of this technique is the butterfly technique, where so much fat is being converted into chakra that it spouts massive butterfly wings out of the back of the Akamichi clan member using it. But still, all of this is only yang release. What if Choji were to hypothetically learn things like lightning release, or earth release, or water release, and use that in conjunction with his partial body expansion? Imagine a Chidori coming from a 300 foot Choji. I mean, Choji in essence operates like his own Susana, meaning that any jutsu generated from a body that large would be massive, which could possibly put him on par with the likes of Susano users. Though probably not because it's his body getting hit, not a giant chakra skeleton. But speaking of people who are Joni now and really just still managing to be useless, next up on our list, we have Rock Lee. Rock Lee is low key sneaky important to Konoha. Why do I say this? Well, we learned in Naruto the last that Rock Lee is training a group of people in the way of the eight gates called the Suicide Corps. And Rock Lee and the rest of his Suicide Corps were able to activate up to, I believe, the sixth gate and cut the meteor that was about to hit Konoha in half. Now, mind you, one half was still gonna fall in Konoha until Sasuke cut that half into a bunch of little pieces. But still, being able to kick a meteor in half very impressive. Outside of training other people in the ways of the eight gates, Rock Lee is just a high level Joni. But for Rock Lee, that is a significantly lower bar than for Choji. See, Rock Lee as it currently stands is probably the strongest person in Konoha that's not a cyborg or has a karma marking. And that's if you lowball Naruto and Sasuke post nerf. If you want to lowball Rock Lee, he's at least the fourth strongest person in Konoha that's not a cyborg or has a karma marking, with only team seven being stronger than it. But here's the thing about Rock Lee. He only uses Taijutsu. And you want to know the funny thing about these Otsutsuki threats? 
sets, their only weakness is Taijutsu. Momoshiki had Rinnegan in his hands that were able to absorb all ninjutsu. Any Karma Mark user also has this ability. Ishiki and now Kawaki have the Sukuna Hikona, the ability to shrink all ninjutsu to the point where it's irrelevant. So you know the only counter to these kinds of powers? Fists. Why Rock Lee is not involved in these battles against Ishiki and Momoshiki and Kawaki baffles me. Especially when you consider the fact that Kishimoto is well aware everyone loves him. He got a spin-off anime. And I will never get over the fact that Rock Lee in the rest of the Konoha 13 got jumped by Ishiki when he pulled up on Konoha. I strictly do not believe that Rock Lee in the 7th or 8th gate wouldn't have stood a fair to good chance against Ishiki. Ishiki doesn't have Madara's healing factor. He's not bouncing back from a night guy. And now obviously without the extrasensory perception of either the Rinnegan or Sage mode dodging Ishiki's mini little rods is damn near impossible, but I want better out of him. And I know he's got it in him. So how do I change him to be more useful? Just be around. You don't even have to open the eighth gate. In the seventh gate, you will be massively useful. Speaking of somebody that should be in the battles against the Otsutsuki, next up on the list, we have Shino. Nick, what do you mean? How could Shino ever be in the battle against the Otsutsukis? Give me a second. So we're well aware that there is several very powerful bugs that the Aburame clan has access to that Shino has compatibility with, but doesn't use because he has morals. The most specific of which being the Rinkaichu. This is a nano-sized bug that Tarune Aburame uses and it makes him insanely powerful. This nano-sized bug crawls over the skin of the Aburame and makes their skin essentially Poison. Anybody that they touch, the Rinkai Chu will seep onto, and the Rinkai Chu, when on somebody else's body, eat away at their flesh and bones. It's like incredibly corrosive acid that even one touch from basically spells your undoing. Now, we know that Shino has an affinity with the Rinkai Chu, but chooses not to use them, which is why Tarune, who did choose to use them, ended up as Donza's right hand man. But this isn't the only, in but this isn't the only insect that Shino doesn't use. Yoji Aburame, an Aburame clan member from Itachi's light novels who killed Shisui, had a specific species of bugs referred to as the Kochu. This bug was roughly the size of a mosquito, and once it bites its intended target, it paralyzes them, but also upon paralyzing them, injects them with enough deadly poison to kill an elephant. Not to mention that after you die, this poison is entirely undetectable. It was Yoji Aburame in the use of this bug that caused Shisui to be frozen still when Danzo stole his eye. And because Shisui was fully aware that he had been poisoned, it's why he told Itachi to cut him down. And considering the fact that Shino has never met a bug he wasn't compatible with, he could probably also find compatibility with this Kochu. But also, for the same reason he doesn't use the Rinkaichu, probably chooses not to because of morality. These bugs can't be used without killing the target. But what if Shino, realizing the strain on the highest level of Shinobi in Konoha, realizes that he needs to take a step forward in terms of power? What if Shino, upon recognizing the fact that Naruto has lost Kurama, Sasuke has lost the Sixth Tome Rinnegan, and Konoha is left kind of defensiveless at the whim of Kawaki and a bunch of cyborgs, decides to throw his morals to the side and acquire as many powerful insects as he can? Because here's the thing, much in the same capacity that the Otsutsuki are weak to Taijutsu, they're also weak to bug users. As a Rinnegan can't absorb bugs, they're not ninjutsu, they're living things. And the same thing could be said for Ishiki or Kawaki Sukuna Hikona, they can't shrink living things. Which actually makes Shino one of the most valid options on Earth when it comes to fighting against the Otsutsuki, but only if he up upgraded his arsenal. And if we saw Shino take this route, we could see him battling with the moral decision of taking on insects that kill people when used. Something that he's refused to do for the 20 or 30 years he's been alive. Which I think would not only be incredible for his character, considering the fact that he too, like 1010, gets very little screen time, but also be great for the story because everybody loves Shino. But speaking of people who have made questionable moral decisions throughout their life, next up we have Sai. I don't really have anything for Sai. I mean, he's a Leader of the Ambu, how much more useful can you get besides that? On top of that, he's got a team of Genin that are technically anime canon only that he's teaching to be Ambu right now. I, I, I don't know, he's he's doing fine. On top of that, unlike a lot of the other adults in Konoha right now, he hasn't lost his touch. Considering the fact he's in charge of protecting Naruto and running the Ambu, he kind of has to stay in touch with his ninjutsu. So genuinely, no notes, which is kind of gonna be a small trend from here on out. Because next up we have Shikamaru. Shikamaru is also incredibly useful. See, when most people think of Shikamaru, they're like, oh yeah, he's the right hand of the Hokage. He's super useful. But Shikamaru is a lot more than just the right hand of the Hokage. Shikamaru is also the leader of the Shinobi Alliance. Well, actually, it's now called the Shinobi Union. Meaning that Shikamaru is the head of the organization that keeps all five of the ninja villages 
at peace with each other. So not only is he in charge of basically all domestic affairs, because let's be real, what is Naruto doing? He's also in charge of all international affairs. He is the president. And we've seen him do incredibly well at this job. As in his second light novel, he was able to defuse a possible fifth great shinobi world war. However, in a second light novel, we also see something that makes me a bit sad about him. See, at some point or another in the second light novel, Shikamaru gets really upset with all the five Kage. And when threats against Konoha are levied by the Hidden Stone Village, Shikamaru puts all five of the Kage in to a shadow possession jutsu. Now at first you're like, oh, Shikamaru hasn't lost his touch. This man is broken. But then Naruto breaks out of the shadow possession jutsu, which is fine. I mean, that makes sense. And Naruto gets Shikamaru to release the shadow possession jutsu. Now it's largely implied that Garo could have also broken out of it, but still holding three Kages at once is very impressive. Until Shikamaru kind of pissed off about the whole situation is walking home and tries to use shadow strangle on a tree. And realizes that his shadow strangle can't even crush a tree, which means all the other Kage we're just being polite. And it's at this point that you realize that while Shikamaru is making incredible political, international, and domestic moves, he has lost all combat touch. Which is unfortunate when you consider the fact that since his shadow is a yin release, it can't be absorbed by the likes of Rinnegan or Karma Markings, which is why Shikamaru was able to bind Kawaki. Therefore, if Shikamaru were to train back up his shadow possession style, he could actually play a massive role in the incoming battle against Otsutsuki's and those with Karma Markings. So while I do absolutely acknowledge the fact that Shikamaru plays a massive role for the Shinobi world as a whole, if he was stronger, he could play an even bigger role. Talking about people who play a big role, but could play a bigger one, next up on our list, we have Sasuke. It pains me to say that Sasuke is pretty much doing all that he can. Well, he had his sixth domain ready gone. He was popping around between dimensions, looking for clues about the Otsutsukis. He helped Naruto in the battle against Momoshiki and kind of in the battle against Ishiki. And he's been one of the major deterrents for people like Code and Ishiki when they think about invading Konoha. But currently as it stands, he's a shadow Hokage with no Hokage and no ability to travel between dimensions. So what's the most useful thing that Sasuke could do right now? Die. It's unfortunate. For you guys, maybe not for me. But Sasuke's death would probably activate an MS in Sarada, which he would then be able to take one or even possibly both of his eyes to activate a dual MS or maybe revive the Rinnegan inside of her, vaulting Sarada to the forefront of power, which she absolutely needs considering the fact that she's one of Boruto's only allies. On top of that, Boruto having a grudge for possibly Kawaki killing Sasuke would be a great motivating factor for him to get revenge against Kawaki. So how can Sasuke help the story move forward? Stop breathing. Which brings us to our last entry on this list. Naruto. Naruto is the Hokage. He's the most important character in the entirety of Naruto. He defeated Kaguya, Momoshiki, and Ishii, but he's currently without Kurama, trapped in a subspace dimension where time and space don't exist. So currently, as it stands, he is useless. So how do you make Naruto more useful? Well, one, you'd have to break him out of the Daikoku Ten. Seems like a good start. Two, we would have to get him another tailed beast. Because currently, as it stands, Naruto, without the help of a tailed beast, is kind of weak. I mean, he's still probably the strongest out of the five Kage currently, but in the grand scheme of the bad guys of Boruto, he's weak. Having just Sage Mode and possibly Six Pass Chakra to boost him to a level of somewhat relevancy. So how do we make him relevant again? Well, we slap another tail beast in there. Now, unfortunately, this probably won't be the Ten Tails, because it was recently brought back to my attention that Code broke the Ten Tails into a bunch of little Ten Tails clones. So the idea of not only defeating all of those clones and then shoving them back into the form of the Ten Tails, so then we can now have Naruto take the Ten tails and shove it inside of himself to become a 10 tails in jerky seems like a bit of a stretch there are a lot of tailed beasts out there who have a lot of love for naruto specifically sun goku and isobu and while technically every tailed beast outside of kiyuki is currently just chilling. It's a possibility that Naruto could become the Jinchuriki for seven out of the nine tailed beasts, which would give him power comparable to what he had with Kurama. With that power, Naruto would once again be in the relevancy sphere of one of the higher powered people in the entirety of Naruto, which would allow him to fight side by side with the likes of Boruto and Kawaki. But more than that, and more than anything, Naruto could just try being a father. And maybe, just maybe, if he spent more time with his family, they all wouldn't be trying to kill each other currently. But what do you guys think? How would you make the Konoha 13 more useful or relevant in the modern day of Boruto? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Listen, a lot of these entries could have just been be better parents. <laughs>